Hi there, my name is Liz and I'm an SRE teaching Google Cloud customers how to build and operate reliable services. And I'm Seth, a developer advocate focused on infrastructure and operations. In the previous episode, we discussed SLOs and error budgets as a means of balancing availability and new feature development. In this episode, Liz and I discuss toil. So Liz, from what I understand, Toil is just work that I don't like to do. So emails, meetings, commuting to work. So what can I do to reduce my toil? Hold on a second, Seth. Those things aren't specifically toil. So we call those things overhead because they're things that are not directly tied to a production service. So they're just a requirement of any office job, really. Most people at the company, not just SREs, have to do expense reports and so forth. And that's not really toil. OK. so. If toil isn't just work that I don't like to do, what is it then? Toil is the kind of work that's tied to running a production service that tends to be manual, repetitive, automatable, tactical, and devoid of long-term value. Additionally, toil tends to scale linearly as the service grows. I see. So each time an operator needs to touch a production system, that represents some toil time. But what if I codify all of the times that I need to touch it and I just run a script instead of manually running the commands? You've reduced the amount of toil you have to do, but you haven't made it not toil because you still have to run that script every single time the system requires an intervention. So that still is manual. And it gets even worse the larger your service grows because you have to keep doing it over and over and over again. OK. but And you also said something, the task has to be repetitive too. So if I just do it maybe once or twice, is that still toil or no? That is probably not toil, at least the first or second time, or at least it's not toil that's worth automating. You really want to automate toil when it gets to the point that you're doing it three or four times or where it's taking hours and hours out of your day. I see. So if a task can be automated, it probably should be automated. Uh, what about things that are pretty common in operations like you know pager alerts? So pager alerts are almost always toil because of the fact that they're interrupt driven and they're reactive. You don't know when it's going to happen and it just swallows a bunch of your time just to get the system back to where it was before. OK, so what if I get paged in the middle of the night to provision additional capacity for a service? So I, you know, I look through the system and I realize that the only way to do this is manually. I have to click buttons. I have to run commands. Uh, so I do that. I get the service back up and running and I go back to sleep. And in the morning, I wake up and I realize that I need to automate this. So I spend about six or seven hours building some automation so that the service can scale automatically in the future. It, that's a lot of toil. How do, we, how do we account for that? Not quite, because of the fact that the time that you spent during the middle of the night between when you got paged and when the system returned to normal from your manual action, that's toil. However, the latter part of what you did during the day, that's a worthwhile project that actually reduces the toil over time because the toil has no enduring value, but the automation that you do in order to reduce the amount of toil you do, that's real useful work. I see. And I think it's clear now why you've coined a new term to define this type of work. There's always going to be tasks that you don't want to do, like overhead, like email and meetings and commuting and expense reports. And there's always going to be kind of operationally grungy tasks, like restarting services um, that, that are devoid of long-term value. So they aren't actually toil in certain cases. In previous episodes, we talked about how everything in SRE is measured, though. So how do we measure toil? So there are two ways that we measure toil. First of all, we try to concentrate the toil into blocks, for instance, during your on-call week, so you don't get pages and tickets off of your on-call week. So it makes it a lot easier to measure when is toil, when is not toil. Additionally, we have people track their toil time, sometimes by sampling, and we send quarterly surveys to make sure that people understand how much of their time is spent on toil do they feel like they have more room. And then toil is also everyone's responsibility. So we'll often ask the product development software engineers to measure their amount of toil as well to make sure that we're spending everyone's time well. So you mentioned that the goal should be to reduce toil. Shouldn't the goal be to eliminate toil entirely? Part of the problem with eliminating toil entirely is that there are often tasks that are not worth automating. Like if you spend an hour fixing something by hand, and it happens maybe three times a year, but it would take you 10 hours to write the automation, that's going to have a very long payoff threshold. Whereas if you have something that's firing all the time, you might want to go and get it out of your way. So as you reduce the amount of toil and leave along the things that are not worth automating, you'll find that there's some amount of toil associated with each service. But you can keep the total amount of toil you do somewhere between 30 and 50% of your time. 
and spend the rest of your time doing worthwhile projects that reduce the toil so that over time you can accept more responsibility for more services or your service can just naturally grow in size and have your amount of workload remain constant. I see. So SREs get to spend at least half, if not two thirds of their time working on real engineering work. The SRE stands for Site Reliability Engineering. Uh, so they get to focus on things like improving reliability, performance, utilization, monitoring, and all of those things can actually reduce toil in the future as well. Yes, that's exactly correct. And also we share our best practices. So when we do these re items of research into how we make our services better, we can often apply them across multiple different SRE teams, so we'll publish white papers within the company or on our blog describing to SREs how they might make sure that their toil stays low and within budget so that we can spend more time making our services better in the long term. At the end of the day, the E in SRE stands for engineering, and engineering work is really what lets our organization scale and meet the demands of all of the applications and services and machines that we support. Great. This has been really helpful. And I think I have a much better understanding of toil and its negative consequences. But toil isn't always entirely negative. Sometimes it's worthwhile to have some amount of predictable and automatable work for individual people to cut their teeth on. For instance, let's suppose that you have someone new to your team that wants to learn how does the system actually work before you put them on call. Well, you might have them poke around at the system manually in order to fix something that you already had lying around. Also, it's really helpful to have things that people feel satisfied by doing where they get an immediate reward rather than working at a project for the long term and not necessarily knowing when it's going to finish. So sometimes it's helpful for people to do those tasks in the short term, but we don't think it's a good idea for people to focus entirely on doing toil because that doesn't really advance the engineering part of their job and it can cause career stagnation and unhappiness in the long term. So toil and toil budgets do not have a direct relation to the DevOps pillars that we've discussed in previous episodes, but they do closely influence the desire to measure everything and reduce organizational silos. By giving operators a quantitative measurement, toil and toil budgets ensure a balance between administering the system and improving it. This has really helped a lot. I think it's a lot clearer now why we say that class SRE implements DevOps. Thank you to everyone for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and also stay tuned for our next video where we discuss how Google teaches SRE practices to customers through the Customer Reliability Engineering Program.